Yo, Shortbox Nation, this is Botter, and I'm here to tell you right now that con season starts early this year with the return of Northeast Florida's premier anime, comic book, and sci-fi event, Collective Con. That's right, Northeast Florida's largest pop culture convention returns for its 10th year on March 8th through the 10th at the Prime Osborne Center in Jacksonville, Florida. 10 years of Collective Con, they're pulling all the stops out to make sure this is a can't-miss event. And the guest list they got going, don't even get me started on the guest list. I mean, they've got A-list celebrity guests and voice actors from some of your favorite movies, anime, and video games like Elijah Wood and Sean Ashton, Ray Park, Trisha Helfer, Ross Marquin, Max Middleman, and bo herself would be there, Katie Sackhoff. Tell me what other convention is giving you the opportunity to meet Frodo and Sam from Lord of the Rings, Darth Maul, and One Punch Man all under the same roof. Only at Collective Con. And if you're looking to get some of your favorite comics signed, or if you want to get an original sketch from some of the best comic artists in the world, well, you're in luck because there'll be plenty of comic and creator guests there, like DC comic artist extraordinaire Clay Mann, Harvey Award nominated illustrator John Taylor Christopher, Marvel and DC cover artist Chris Stevens, and acclaimed Star Wars author Timothy Zahn. They'll all be at Collective Con this year. And if you're looking to bring the family or if you want to make a weekend out of it, you're in luck because there'll be so much going on at CollectiveCon that weekend in the form of vendors, fan panels, video game tournaments, cosplay contests, after parties, and a bunch of fan events. You can purchase single and three-day weekend passes now using the link in this episode's show notes or by going to CollectiveCon.com to book your tickets and hotel. Buy your tickets now, and I'll see you at CollectiveCon, March 8th through the 10th. Now let's start the show. (coughs) My pants. Uh, caught on barbed wire. Good lord! Choke an A bomb! Yeah! Becoming radioactive. From this day forward, I shall call myself Radioactive Man. So that's how it happened. I would have thought being hit by an atomic bomb would have killed him. Now you know better. Turn the page, Bart! Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the Short Box Podcast. The Short Box Podcast is recorded live from Jacksonville, Florida. Warren, you, you, Warren, you fit in just, just right because... Because uh, because you're you're doing more dividing than Botter is this episode. You're the guy I got to look out for. Well, for the record, no, I listen back to. No, no, no. Let me let me say. Like, hey, wait, let me, let me say like, let me take that remark now, seriously. Now, see, I have made a career out of not backing Botter, ruining friendships. Out of not backing Botter up, but I gotta say, I side with Botter here. Y'all, y'all boys sounded tense, and even listening to the episode, I was like, damn, C and Ed about to have a moment on here. All right. Yeah, it's, so it's you know it's, so it's good for the Botter, show. I don't think Botter was was trying to set y'all up. I really think y'all sounded mad, but that's just me. Ah, uh, it's all love, man. All right, y'all boys, ready to get started on this shit? I was born ready, yes. baby. And let me add cheers to you boys, to to Cesar, to, to you, Warren. Thank you all of you. And let's uh, do a bomb ass fucking episode. Here we go. That's all I know how to do. I'm ready? Baby. Yo, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm now that was the Cesar way of doing it. Let me just do it my way. A short box nation. I'm your host for this evening, Botter Milligan. That's good. That's a 10 out of 10 if I've ever heard one. But uh, let me show you how it's really I'm going to throw right? up. <laughs> Yo, short box nation. And hey, welcome back. This is episode 344. The, the, the road to 350 is getting closer and closer every week. So if you're tuning in for the first time, welcome to the show. My name is Botter Milligan. And I'm joined by two guys I consider great friends. And even bigger fucking headaches. First up, calling in from a remote location man. is my right hand man, Cesar Cordero. I guess we're I guess we're doing that now, huh? Should I just talk like Howard Stern the whole time? Is that what that is? <laughs> Robin, bring in the booger reader. Oh my god. It's so sexy. It's so sexy. <laughs> what up, C? Hey man. I'm very excited to do this little uh this little episode here, because uh I got a lot of things to say. Um You'll you'll get to who we're who we're talking to here in a sec, so uh, I'll let you get to it. I appreciate it. Look, listeners, joining us for this special episode is the return of the man behind the Best Simpsons collection on Instagram at Bart of Darkness, 
And he's also the host of my favorite Simpsons podcast, not because I've been on that show a few times, but for other <laughs> reasons as well. Uh, it's called Simpsons is Greater Than. Shortbox Nation, let's welcome back Mr. Warren Evans to the show. Wow. Wow. Welcome, Warren. What's up? What's up? What's up? I, I am not worthy of that introduction. <laughs> um, I was going to do something where I was like, oh, you know, and they sometimes they call me Captain Squid or one of the other like weird characters what? in this book. But I decided not to do that. But I'm just going to go ahead and let people know on the mic that I was going to do it. So it's almost the same as if I did do it. You know what I'm saying? That's 100% right. Yeah. Your fictional landing was probably really better than the real landing. I agree. Uh, but Warren, look, uh, oh uh, just in case someone is missing out, Warren, do me a favor and do your spiel for Simpsons is greater than so there's no excuse for any of our listeners not to be subscribing to your podcast right now. Man, I will happily do that. If anyone out there, uh, you know, likes The Simpsons, but is concerned that you might not like The Simpsons enough. Well, let me tell you about Simpsons is greater than a podcast that I created over COVID to further dive down the rabbit hole that is my my degrading mind uh, when it comes to my love of The Simpsons. But all joking aside, if you're, if you're someone that just wants to hear from people on the show or people that really like the show from other creative ventures, you know, I interview people like that every week. And sometimes I even bring on people like Botter when it's a slow week. Uh, <laughs> To talk about all kinds of things, whether it be Treehouse of Horror episodes or, you know, whatever you can think of. If you like The Simpsons, if it has to do with The Simpsons, Simpsons is greater than is about that. So come check it out, man. Hang out with us. I think you will all find something to enjoy. Yeah, listeners, uh, it's going to be a lot of witty puns and, and shit talking and, and low blows this episode. Jesus Christ. What, are we, what did I sign up for? <laughs> Like exactly we, that. I thought it was, yeah, exactly yeah, was going to be. I thought it was going to be friend time. Water's like, nah, we're going to fuck each other. It's like, oh my god, <laughs> is this human centipede? Like we we asked Warren to join us today because we'll be talking about a very special comic book superhero in this episode. He's a title character of Bart Simpson's favorite comic book and a love letter to the golden and atomic age of superheroes. He even has his own classic call to action catchphrase that goes a little something like this: Up and at him. And if that's not enough of a clue, I'll just come out and say it, damn it. We're talking about the Simpsons' own atomic Avenger, Radioactive Man. The larger Simpsons in-show and real-world comic universe is a topic that I've wanted to talk about with Warren for a while now. So I decided the best way to start the conversation is with a dedicated spotlight on the greatest hero of them all this week. But before we get into that, I want to remind all you loyal Showbox listeners that live in Jack's and the surrounding area that we're getting back on stage next month record a live podcast, and you're all invited. Come out for a Spider-Man-themed live show on Friday, December 10th. We'll be recording the show at the Brian Gooding Planetarium at the Museum of Science and History. That's Mosh for all you Jack's locals. Come be a part of a live audience and register for some free tickets by visiting the link in this episode's show notes. We'll be talking about Spider-Man's Rogue Gallery to celebrate the upcoming release of the Spider-Man No Way Home movie. And God if that's, help us. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and if that's not enough of an enticement for you, what about the promise of a world premiere for a new short box project that's been years in the making. You won't want to miss out if you're in Jack's or the surrounding area that night. Invite some friends if you got them. Grab some free tickets while they're available. And be there for the event on December 12th. Invite some friends yeah, come if on out. you we're gonna got have, them. Uh, if you got them. Yeah, we're going to we're gonna have uh, Botter's underwear on display for everyone to smell. It's going to be wonderful. <laughs> He's going to pass it out like a creepy priest, you know? No, that's actually how we're going to clear out the show when we go over the amount of time I paid for because it's extra amount of money a minute for every minute. So yeah, come on, so, Drew someone's going to look to the side when no one wants to leave and be like, "Get the underwear." <laughs> break in case, break in case I'm cheap, which is all the time. And last but not least, real quick before we get into the main event, earlier this week the ranks of the short box elite grew by one. So I'd like to formally welcome our newest short box patron, Kara Reichart. Kara, oh, wow. thank you for becoming a Patreon subscriber. Thank you for your support. Thank and you, give Kara. yourself yeah, and give yourself a round of applause for making maybe the smartest decision you'll make all year. All right. Your we're whole life. To have your you. whole life. This is the best decision you've made your whole life. If you have children, we're better than them. We're better than your children. If you have a, a husband or wife, we're better than them as well. Thank you for making us a priority. Yeah, I mean, it's no offense to them. It's just we set the bar. No, no, there's no disrespect. High. It's just that's the way it is. Well, that's you you also systems. you also don't make the rules. I mean, if that, that's just how True. it is. I mean, you can't help it. True. Very good. Yeah. I, you know, Warren, you're going to go places. You keep sucking up, you're going to go places. <laughs> <laughs> With all that said, it's time to get into our main event and talk about Bart Simpson's favorite comic book, 
Radioactive Man. If you're a listener who was lucky enough to own any of the comics from the 1993 or 2000 Radioactive Man comics, we'll specifically be talking about Radioactive Man's origin from issue one, as well as issue 88, which is the first appearance of his sidekick, Fallout Boy. So follow along if you got those, or do yourself a favor and consider watching these Radioactive Man focused episodes of The Simpsons. Uh, there's episode 21 of season two, titled Three Men in a Comic Book, one of my personal favorites. Or yeah. you can check out episode two from season seven, appropriately titled Radioactive Man. I think those would give you a good grasp of the character if you're unfamiliar or you want to see more of him in action after this episode. Uh, gentlemen, I- I'll look to you and ask, how straightforward and comical is Radioactive Man's origin? I mean, it, you got wealthy layabout Claude Kane the Claude Kane the Third. He acquires his powers after surviving an atomic bomb explosion while on the way to collect his weekly allowance from his rich scientist <laughs> father. I feel like that is an origin dream waiting to happen. And who might I add? His scientist father, right? Not only developed said atomic bomb, but he was a hostage of two comically stereotypical Russian, for sure Russian too, Cesar. Oh, yeah. You notice in this one, they were like, Mongo Comics ain't afraid to be like, nah, the enemy is Russian, all right? <laughs> I mean, it's... <laughs> Well, look, look, if we're going to if we're going to do this, let's do it right. All right. Let's play count the tropes here. All right. Because that's what Radioactive Man is. He's he's always hitting on all the comic book tropes. Right. So his name, first and foremost, Radioactive Man, is obviously a pawn on how every superhero in the 60s had their power. How did he get his powers? I don't know. We're in the age of the (laughs) atom. Something radioactive. Either he got bit. Either he survived an explosion. Uh, either he was experimenting on something he should have been, you know, it's, it's all, it's all there. And the fact that it's, he's a worthless layabout is what they say. <laughs> like, just like, eh, I'm just a rich guy. My daddy's got money. Uh, what, what the fuck? Who gives a shit? That's, that's great. That it's always like a man about town or, you know, wealthy playboy millionaire. Like, it's kind of like, come on now. Well, my it's like favorite- taking. I was going to say, it's like all the traditions of Marvel and DC are both being parodied. Um, and I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's strange. Butter, you said this comic came out in 93? Well, yeah, that, the first series came out in 93. Yeah. Okay. I wonder if people are old enough to understand what was being parodied, right? Like, I feel like there were some people who got into it that just liked it on the surface level mm. and maybe didn't know why. Um, so if you're listening to this episode, I feel like this is the best place to start. So that way you can kind of hear like all the little tropes that get made, uh, into sort of parody regarding radioactive man. Go ahead, Warren. Sorry. Yeah. Well, no, my, my favorite thing about it is that, uh, it, from the first issue, it lets you know, it's like, oh no, this is issue one. It's from 1952. Uh, so like it dates it right away. And I think, you know, there are a lot of tropes, but I think some of the the things about it that I love are that it sort of flips the tropes. Like, like he's in love with this woman, Gloria grand, and she can't stand him. Like he's like, (laughs) yeah, that's Lois Lane. She hates, uh, she hates Clark Kent. It's true. But also as it goes on, the love interest never develops. I mean, when you go into, you know, no spoilers, but when you go into issue 88, like clearly they've developed some sort of relationship and she still hates his guts. Like he's like, Oh, I'll make it up to you. We'll go to lunch. He's like, seriously, it's fine. Like (laughs) it's fine. You know? So I think it's really interesting how it sort of plays with that dynamic and makes it not, it doesn't actually blossom into love. It blossoms into resentment. Right. Because there's the comedy. (laughs) And I think, uh, I mean, as far as his power set, you know, super strength, the ability to, 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 to flight. I think he's got like radioactive powers as well. I think his, his greatest superpower is being oblivious in issue eight. Uh, I found that one page towards the end pretty comical where uh, he's flying back after fighting. It was a Magmar. What was it? Uh, Magmo. Magmo. Thank you. After fighting Magmo. And like, he's like, damn it. I, I'm, I just missed lunch with Gloria. I got to go make it up for her. And she's like, uh, nah, I already you know, took lunch. Uh, I already continued on with my day. <laughs> it's really good. I mean, you know, I also, I think, you know, you look back to his origin, like in the beginning of, of number one, and we're going to get into it a little bit more in depth, but you know how he's like, oh, you know, I've got to, I've got to find a hat or something to cover up this lightning bolt. And the moment he goes to rescue her, she's like, why are you wearing that ridiculous hat? <laughs> like she just, you know, just hates him. It's, I, I find that so funny. It was pretty cool to learn that that lightning bolt is like ingrained in his fucking head. Like it's a permanent thing. And now he's got like the trope of always wearing a funny ass hat yeah. everywhere he goes. I think in um yeah, issue 88, when he meets, you know, uh, fucking Richard Nixon, <laughs> Richard Nixon's like had that thought bubble. What's this idiot doing wearing a hat indoors? Right. 
And Haru. To, <laughs> and to, to the point where to the point where it's an ongoing joke that he's constantly trying to to get it removed and something always comes up. It's like, ah, you know, we're going to have to get back to that bolt later. I'm not going to be able to do it. He's like, ah, my attempts to have a normal scalp have been dashed again. Which reminds classic, me a lot of a uh, classic Kirby, the thing. You beat me to it, see. Exactly. The, the the comic tropes and just it being such a big love letter to, you know, the golden age, the the, the atomic age and, and just like all those classic comic book characters. They, they wear it it's on the It's funnier street. because like he's you never like the the deformity in like Fantastic Four is like oh man it's completely permanent and it's all over his body and it's not really a joke it's it's kind of horrific and this guy has to live with this right like there's some real drama going on and then you look <laughs> you look at Radioactive Man and his deformity is is funny like it's it's like what, what does that say about us that we could laugh at this man who has a big ass <laughs> fucking lightning bolt coming out of his head and, and we're just, just terrible like, people. <laughs> Like, it's like, ah, the human condition. Hilarious. You're a mutant. Warren, being the, the man when it comes to collecting all things related to Simpsons, uh, what's your Radioactive Man comic collection look like? Like, what, would Bart be proud of what you got? I, I think he would. So um, it, it's one of those things where, you know, we, we talked about how my favorite thing about the comics is that they sort of dip in. So they create the illusion. Uh, and if you go into the comics not knowing this, you're going to be pretty confused. You you cannot collect all of them because they only made snippets throughout this, you know, fictional timeline. So it's like, oh, this goes from 1 to 88 to 216 or whatever, all the way up to like 1000, but there's only 16 issues. Uh and then, you know, you have some random appearances of him and other things and uh I do believe I have almost all of them. I might be missing like one or two. Um but the funny thing is, again, when I started collecting the comics and didn't you know, I, I, I had forgotten that that was the case. I was like, man, why am I having such a hard time finding some of these issues? And it's because they don't exist. Uh, <laughs> You're like, now, wait a minute. I've got issue 318. I've got 61. I'm, I'm missing a bunch. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is mad confusing to try to keep track of it. I mean, like, you know, I sent that mycomicshop.com link. And, you know, there's only two series uh, for Radioactive Man, um, according to that. And when you open each one, it's like, I mean, it's, it's a Warren's point that the numbers that they jump from, um, but but it's kind of cool to know that like that was purposeful, right? Like yeah. they wanted the reader to feel like they could follow the evolution of Radioactive Man from like his origin in the 1950s, which is dated. All of those comics are dated, uh, much different. Like the 1993 series the issue one is dated 1950, and then you got like a 1968 date yeah. on on another one. But it's kind of cool and funny that they committed to that joke of like, look, we're gonna confuse the shit out of comic book price guys and, and collectors, but this is way too funny. And, you know, we're taking you into the world of, of, of Bart and how he would kind of collect, you know, Radioactive Man and, and to be able to see like these big milestones. Yeah. And, and to that point too, I want to say, you know, one thing that I find interesting and we're, we're talking more about Radioactive Man than we are, you know, Bongo comics in general, but I do want to say that I think it's really cool uh, that Radioactive Man, we're at the very least Bart Man who, you know, it is, it's just him, his obsession with radioactive man that was used very heavily to launch what Bongo would go on to do. Like, you know, the Simpsons comics and stories and, and little projects like that were some of the first things that led to Bongo. So I think it's cool to see how clearly this went on to be, you know, it was always meant to be Simpsons comics and Bart Simpson comics, but radioactive man and the whole Bart man angle of that was you know, one of the reasons it popped off from the beginning. I think that's kind of cool that they use this superhero trope to launch comics that end up not being about superheroes, but it helped them get in that space. So on the topic of, of Bongo, I wanted to uh, highlight the, the, the creative team for these issues that, that we're highlighting today. So the creative team for the issues that we were all supposed to read are also the same creative team for the entire first run of, of Radioactive Man comics. Uh, from the 1993 series. I think you get some additional artists and, and inkers and whatnot for the second run in 2000. Yeah. But in this first run, you got Steve Vance on script and layouts, his wife Cindy Vance as co-plotter and colorist. And then, of course, you got, you know, Bill Morrison credited for a finished art, which would also probably include, like, inking duties. He's and, the and, anchor. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. And Warren, I understand that of this trio, Bill Morrison is your favorite artist to ever draw The Simpsons. And you've also interviewed him for your podcast, not once, but twice. Right. I want to hear from you. You know, can you tell us about Bill's contribution to Radioactive Man and, and Bongo Comics? Oh, for sure. So w one thing that's cool to know about Bill Morrison is 
Uh, the reason he even got a job for the Simpsons is he was working in like an advertising agency and he knew, uh, he knew people that, that were familiar with his work from working on, you know, posters for Disney and, and all these other things that he was doing that were far more complicated than, you know, Matt Groening's art style. Uh, but Millie Smythe, who was, who was very, uh, important in the world of the Simpsons and Futurama and other Matt Groening projects, she knew Matt. Uh, she, you know, recruited Bill to come work on merchandise for the Simpsons. So a lot of that early merchandise, uh, the video game artwork, you know, a lot of the packaging for Mattel, things like that. Bill Morrison drew most of that. I mean, there were other artists, but to say Bill did a lot of it is an understatement. Like Bill is, was the main Simpsons artist in those early days when it came to anything print. So when he got the opportunity to start Bongo with Matt Groening, and Steven Cindy Vance, uh, that was like a dream come true for him. I mean, he talks about how like, you know, it was so exciting and there was so much hype about those early days because Fox didn't own the publishing rights. Matt did. So they were really able to do so much cool stuff and they knew they were going to get to try a lot of cool stuff with these comics. And Matt allowed them to stretch their legs and, and, you know, get outside of the art style and try different things. And he really, you know, wanted them to bring in, you know, writers and people from other comics and do all this cool stuff. So Bill's contribution is often, uh, I wouldn't say underappreciated, but just straight up. It's something that it took people too long to realize. I mean, even when it comes to Futurama and other projects. So, you know, I'd say his contribution to the art style and just the overall uh, thing that bon what Bongo would become for two decades, Bill deserves a lot of that credit. Oh, said. Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna bring up. It seems like for the at least from an artist's perspective regarding the Radioactive Man comics, he kind of takes somewhat of a back seat and lets like Steve sort of do like dude scripts and layout is fucking hard. That shit is hard to do, and not to say inking isn't hard. Inking, you have to have a clean style in order for this stuff to pop. And I looked at some of uh, Bill Morrison's artwork and. By God, does he have all that? And uh, just some of the tributes that Steve does in these books and some of the stuff, in, you know, for those who are maybe not aware of his work, if you ever listen to ska music, he did the cover of Welcome to Rockview uh, for Less Than Jake. Hmm. Um, Steve Vance also does a lot of the Mystery Science Theater uh, movie posters. Um, he's freaking phenomenal. Um, however, he does have a different style than Bill. And I think together when they when they create a comic, you get sort of like Steve's kind of dynamic sort of poses and the way he lays things out with Bill's sort of really clean, sort of Kirby esque. I, I would say I would say fairly man, this might be too much of a, a fucking thing, but he's Finish kind of it. he's kind of fucking Frazetta ish with his inks, man. Um it's 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 clean, it's smooth, it's rounded out, very, 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 very tight technically mm -hmm. and uh you said cindy does the colors as well right yeah mm -hmm. can't man like it's it's like a freaking one two three knockout punch like it's so 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 good and like it's something that i didn't intend on i guess geeking out over because uh botter let me borrow three of the comics as per your request warren and it's like yo these are the ones and so many of the jokes in there are are so funny <laughs> But at the same time, there's a lot of visual stuff that if you're like into 60s comics that even art style wise, you you have to laugh at just some of the designs. Yeah. Like there was always a magic user guy on the team. There was always <laughs> like an alien guy on the team. There's a there's a damsel on the team who is really good at something very, very, very specific. And then right. you have a Superman type guy, right? And it's yeah. it's so funny to see how they play with all of these from a visual perspective within the layouts because like those old 60s comics were always trying to cram so much artwork into a <laughs> small box and they do it like it's it's phenomenal like they there are so many visual layers and i'm i think it's i think it's a testament to both bill uh cindy and steve and i think there was somebody else mentioned in, as far as the artwork is concerned because i know I saw that for the Who Washes the Washman uh, comic. <laughs> there was somebody else that was credited on there. I don't want to do them any injustice, but uh, yeah. Phenomenal. See, 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 what's your, um, what, what is your, 
Simpson uh, comic collection looking like? Because last time I was over, you, you busted out what I think was a, a Treehouse of Horror maybe issue, and it had like a Bernie Wrightson um, uh, yeah. story or, or or whatnot. I'm not going to front. I have no little to no Simpsons comics, uh, nothing bongo uh, at all. And the only reason I have that comic is because Bernie Wrightson was Damn. in it, and Bernie Wrightson's like my favorite artist. Um, so, but it's, it's, it, this was a, this was a welcome treat. Um, I'm, I more or less was familiar with a lot of the bongo stuff that wasn't radioactive man, hmm, which right. is funny to say now that I've been, ex- now that I've been exposed to this radioactivity. <laughs> um, <Up> and Adam. <laughs> yeah, no shit. I get to, uh, I get to kind of experience this. It's, it's, it's really funny and it's very niche. Which is kind of, um, I don't know. I guess Futurama is kind mm. of that way too, funny in a niche sort of way, where you're like, okay, all right, like not everybody that likes The Simpsons can approach Futurama and dig it. But if you if you're hip to some of the tropes they're making fun of, you're into it. Like I feel right. like Radioactive Man is kind of like the Futurama version of that. Mm. Like if you're a '60s comic That's a good book point. fan. Yeah. You can approach Radioactive Man, and it'll it'll hit you the same way Futurama does. But if you don't if you don't get all those tropes, you're not gonna. I don't think my opinion. I don't think the comic's gonna be good in the same way. You're not gonna laugh as hard. Um, <laughs> just I'm laughing at so. What's the name of the Doctor Strange character that is on the like the analog the, version of their the Justice su- League? The Superior Squad. That's the name of the yes. Team. Uh, he's got like a, a hood uh, and like you only see his eyeballs and he's oh, always um, doing this. Yeah, it's uh Plasmo the Mystic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, to, to add to C's point, um on on the topic of like using not only like visual aspects of like, you know, your your sixties and your golden age, but how cool is it that they, they literally include uh artifacts from like these old comics? You know, I, I just I looked I opened up the issue to go find the name, but um, the very first page after the cover is a uh one of those old like gag, uh jokey products that you know mail in order. Oh, the ads. Buy. Yeah, the, thank you. The ads that you could buy, like the fact that they took the time out to make. And I mean, it's a lot of ads. It's a lot of text. It's a lot of. It looks just like it. Like you could swipe by it, thinking, "Oh, this is a fucking old comic book ad." Let me keep on moving. But even X-ray these, goggles. Yeah. Like even the like a, a live pet stink bug, a surprise package and <laughs> flesh eating plant. Like even these are kind of funny to, to, to read through and catch and whatnot. Yeah. And to the point that they even had like they, they had letters from fans in that in oh, Radioactive cool. Man number one. Like you can read some stuff in the back. Uh, and they did that. That kind of comes from Simpsons Illustrated, which is sort of what birthed Bongo, which is sort of what started all this. But one thing I do want to throw in, you know, I'm talking about Bill Morrison and, and Steven Cindy Vance. Uh, Bill also told me that during those days, like in the early days of Bongo, they were basically like, you know, having sleepovers to finish Hmm. these comics to the point that like Bill would almost like skip part of the process and go straight to inking, uh, because they had it dialed in so hard and they just didn't have the time. So he would just, you know, go right into get it from Steve and go right into the next step. And just like, it's really incredible to look at what they were doing and how much fun they were having, despite the amount of work. But also, I always point out that it's some of the best looking art, hmm. period, for anything Simpsons are these comics. And I think that's just a testament to how much they enjoyed what they were doing because they loved comics and they knew comics. And so they got to, you know, it's almost like Mad Magazine. They got to parody these things that they like and make fun of them. It is it is a tough thing to do to make a comic book. And if you if you and your team aren't working together with that chemistry, it's going to show. It's definitely sure. going to show. And thank God that they had that sort of <laughs> sleepover energy, which is oh, yeah. basically a uh, giggle fest, 2000, whatever, <laughs> you know, like, it's like, oh, your friend's over. Yeah, everything's funny because I'm sleep deprived. <laughs> I oh, think man. I think their love uh, of comics is apparent from from the jump. And when I say the jump, I'm I'm talking just the covers, right? You know, um, I, I found that article. I'm sorry, not even prior to finding that article where they compared the, the comic swaps. Uh, Warren, you, you would send me photos of some of the comics. Um, the Simpsons thank comics you for finishing that sentence. Huh? Oh. <laughs> I said, thank you for finishing that sentence. Warren, you would send me photos, pause, <laughs> of comics. Stuff, yeah. But you would send me photos of those Bongo comics and these Radioactive Man comics. And, and granted, I, I think some of them uh, you might have not recognized, but I'd be like, wait a minute. Yo, that's a, 
That's a cover swipe of like this Jim Steranko X Men cover. Oh wait a minute, that's a Watchmen cover. You know, See what so I, mean? I, I think it's I think to, to Cesar's point, if you are a, a, a comic fan and you know you've kind of like read your fair share of, of comics from both the big two and you know the Golden Age stuff, and even like you know like Spawn number one gets a cover swipe. I think just from the covers alone, you have a really fun time kind of picking out like, oh shit, this is a, a you know a, a fucking a montage or or they're paying respect to comic legends like Kurt Swan and his like Legion of Superheroes Yo. covers and. And the yes, Batman dude. movie special comic by Jerry Ordway, you know, oh, you know they, they bite that. I felt like Radioactive Man, and even maybe just, it's safe to say Bongo Comics at large, is a giant love letter to the comic books that, you know, um, th- that, that we love. But also it's very apparent, like, the influence that they've got. And Warren, I, I wanted to ask you, because, you know, uh, among not only the covers that I was able to identify from a lot of the stuff that you sent me, but uh, much like C was saying that, it sounds like Bongo Comics also had a pretty stellar roster of like guest artists and writers. I mean, I think Paul Dini writes, no, I know Paul Dini writes the intro to this Radioactive Man hardcover, but C had mentioned, you know, comic legend like Bernie Wrightson doing a Simpsons uh, issue. Yeah. Are there other artists that, that you noticed? Man, so it's one of those things where I think early into the run, especially on like the Treehouse of Horror comics and, and, and some of the Radioactive Man stuff, they really were just like, you know, we want to get the creator of Starman to come in and do a, you know, a copy or do some, do some, do a story for us, or they would have different people come in and do art in their style. And I think that that's really interesting because, you know, I want to point out when we talk about the cover swaps that now a big thing is like mashup art. You know, you have Mm -hmm. artists like thumbs that are huge for doing essentially like, you know, the Simpsons as Pokemon and things like that. Seeing these like parodies of different styles of art told through a different character, you know? And I think it, one of the earliest examples of that outside of Mad Magazine were a lot of these Simpsons comics. And I think they really, I mean, if you look through a list of the color swaps, it's everything from Batman to Watchmen to Spider-Man to I mean, it just they go across the board. Fantastic Four, um, oh yeah, and and being able to work on comics like that with people like Paul Dini and Bernie Wrightson, I want to say even Jeff Darrow, maybe like I can't mm. even. It's like so many people, um, like being able to do that and have that sort of fun. They would even get to the point where they would bring in, like they did an an issue with Alice Cooper and Gene Simmons for That's Treehouse beautiful. of Horror, you know. So they were just having so much fun with these comics, um. And I think that that is such a testament to what Bongo was. And I'm, you know, I was sad when it, when it closed up shop, it had a really good run for something that is at best a, you know, accompaniment piece to a show like the Simpsons. Warren, as someone um, who knows pretty much damn near everything when it comes to the, the actual Simpsons show, is there any key differences between the origin of Radioactive Man and his sidekick Fallout Boy that differ from the comics of, from their show appearance? So I will say uh, the first time you actually really get the origin of Radioactive Man in the show, uh, it is in uh, Three Men in a Comic Book, like you said, uh, which I do want to point out, I do own a cell from that episode where they are fighting in the treehouse. I'm very proud of that cell. Warren, you don't yes. got to impress us. We already, like, oh, okay. we, we know oh, okay. you're, you're the man. Oh, well, see, I wrote nice. in my notes here, uh, make sure you say things that impress Botter and Cesar. <laughs> Burn I'll, that. I'll, I'll, I'm sorry, I'll delete that. Okay. Uh, no, so you see them by issue number one in that episode. And the origin is very similar, but obviously you only get the bullet points. Mm. So it's not an exact thing, but it is roughly the same. I mean, he, you know... Uh, he gets uh, he gets caught in that radiation. Something lands in his head, and and he becomes radioactive. So it's very similar. Uh, the first time you ever see Radioactive Man, though, uh, is in Bart the Genius. I don't know if you said that up top in season one, episode two, and he looks nothing like the Radioactive Man that we know. Mm. And you could also find him in early merchandise drawn, sort of not the way we know him. So mm. they knew right away that that was going to be a thing. Like it was going to be like one of Bart's. Uh, things as he's into this comic book uh, superhero, but they, it took sure. them a, a couple years to, to flesh him out about, you know, two seasons to really start seeing him the right way. Um, but yeah, they, they sort of knew, I wish they would have done more with him in the show. Yeah. If I'm being honest. Yeah. I, I, I think like we had discussed the, the main two radioactive man focused episodes are thir- you know, three men in a comic book and then the radioactive man um, uh, episode where they're trying to reshoot the movie and, and whatnot. So in and, and regards to that, speaking of that episode, actually, 
Um, because we know Milhouse ends up getting the the role of a Fallout Boy in that episode. Uh, does Fallout Boy's origin differ from the comic books uh, to the show? So I really don't think that they like. Well, actually, yes, it does. So in the show, uh, you essentially see Fallout Boy fall under like a laser that then shoots him <laughs> and turns face. him radio. <laughs> and, and so they're like, he's like, is this is this dangerous? And they're like, ah, we're checking on that. And you know, they like set up the shot. Uh, so it is actually because in the comic. Uh, it sort of happens because, um, if I really, if I go through every point right now, it'll be forever, but essentially radioactive man changes his course by making him stop reading these evil comics. And then later he meets the same kid as himself and not as radioactive man. And while trying to save him, they are left hanging on, uh, a machine that transfers radiation through him into fallout boy. So he actually sort of gets his powers from radioactive man. Uh, sort of indirectly, whereas in the movie, it looks like he sort of gets it from like trying to stop traffic or something like that. <laughs> it's almost like he didn't have powers at first. Yeah. Uh, so I found I found that a little bit interesting uh, on this reread because I never really thought about that how it would be different. Yeah, and and, and the thing about like the, the placement, right? Like you know, if, if we're following Radioactive Man's uh, fictitious historical, um, um, you know, uh, lifespan in the comic books, Fallout Boy doesn't. Uh, Rod Rudledge is it Rod Rudledge? Rod I think is, is the identity of Fallout Boy. He does become fall, even though he makes an appearance in issue one of Radioactive Man, um, as the delinquent that Radioactive Man stops from stealing. Not even stops from stealing a TV. Actually helps him helps him deliver the TV to his house, which I think is, is super comical. But Fallout Boy doesn't make his appearance until issue eighty eight, which is just issue two of Radioactive Man. Yeah, but I love the spider. It, it, like not only just the homage to, you know, Peter Parker and Spider-Man's origin, but literally that Peter Parker makes an appearance, you know, in that issue. Yeah. And even like the jokes about superhero sidekicks, I thought uh, towards the when Fall Out Boy is giving his origin and he talks about like, you know, his aunt that is basically in a, in a coma. I forgot what he called it, but she had like fevers or something, but yeah. he was like, you <laughs> it's know, <not> funny. <laughs> he's like, you know, uh, uh, it's so funny when she's like dying. No, 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 no. It's, it's more, I'm saying it's funny when, when he's like, yo, Claude Kane, uh, I now live with Claude Kane, which is, you know, your Batman Robin trope through, he says, he makes a comment about like paying the right caseworker right. to like live with Claude Kane it was it's- hysterical, man. It's funny because it's like it takes – I'm laughing because you have all these – it's like what if what if Marvel in the 60s was were written by crackheads? <laughs> Where it's like you have like, oh, Peter Parker, he's, a, he's Spider-Man, but he has the troubles of an everyday man, like a sick aunt. You know, it's like, oh, Aunt May's sick and she can't pay the bills. And it's like, nah, what if she was in a coma and he's dirt poor? You yeah. know, it's like – what now he's gonna live with a creepy older guy <laughs> they really weave in like uh in my opinion maybe a much edgier sense of like humor into like of like oh, sure. your traditional classic simpsons humor. like it still feels like oh this could easily be you know fit into the whole uh simpsons world yeah not um, for children is what you're saying yeah <laughs> yeah well and not only that but i want to say you talk about the peter parker cameo the hardest i laughed on this read uh, cause I haven't looked through some of these in a few years and, and it was really funny to me to see like, you know, Oh, wouldn't it be great to get these sort of powers? And you see a spider land in his hand and he's like, Oh my God, get this spider out of here. You know, like that is such a funny misdirect. That's such a Simpsons style joke. Um, but I gotta say this too. And, and, you know, we're talking about how these stories are dumb and, and some of them sort of are, uh, but I will say that like, and this is my bias talking. If you took these same stories and told them with a little bit more finesse and a little bit less humor, I think they would actually make for some pretty cool stories. Like, I do think peppered in throughout Yeah, it's the Marvel these, Universe. Yeah, well, sure. <laughs> but I think peppered throughout these stories, there is somewhere hidden in there an actual story that could be cool and at least a little... I mean, it, it would, I guess it wouldn't be different, but you could make a cool story out of this without the jokes. Yo, this is Botter. Sorry for interrupting this episode, but I'll keep it brief. I wanted to let you know about a massive sale we have going on over at the Shortbox store on all of our merchandise and apparel. That's theshortboxstore.bigcartel.com. You can now save 20% off your entire order using the discount code YO, Y-O-O. So if you've been waiting for the right time to finally buy that gauntlet snapback, or if you ever wanted to buy any of the shirts you see me wear on the podcast, well, now's your chance to get them for a steal. We still have a few sizes left of everything, but they 
won't last long, and once they're gone, they are gone. And then I mentioned that all of our apparel is screen printed on high quality material. None of that heat transfer or direct to garment stuff. Our shirts are some of the most comfortable ones you'll ever wear, and the hats look even better in person. So wear your support for the Short Box Nation proudly, knowing that you're going to look damn good doing it. Get to theshortboxstore.bigcartel.com as soon as you can, and don't forget to use that discount code. Yo, Y-O-O, to save 20% off your entire order. All of this information can be found in this episode's show notes if you want to get there faster. Thanks for not pressing fast forward. Now back to the show. Fair enough. Yeah. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, probably, um, I'll tell you another strength of, of these two issues we read is, uh, I mean, Tay's already praised the, the, the art and, you know, uh, Steve and Cindy and Bill, but I just want to reiterate the art in this is fantastic. And especially when you get to a lot of like the splash pages, like the one page kind of like big panels, you know, and the in issue 88 when they fight Magmo or Magmo, I keep saying Magmo. Magmo. Magmo yeah. Thank you. But there's a, I mean, there's a few really badass uh, splash pages. Like when you first get to meet Magmo, uh, when radioactive uh, man and fallout boy both like knock out Magmo, like they, they capture that, like, you know, th- that energy of that, splash page so well like they they know what they're doing man yeah even that even that page with radioactive man like with the american flag oh uh, yeah that's, sick. that's a good like one. that that is like so good even the one where he gets you know uh where he gets the radiate the radiation and it says vada boom uh, behind him <laughs> where the atomic bomb's going yeah up. that yeah, is a excellent. really cool shot i mean any of those would make incredible posters um and then again you know these are these are obviously based off tropes like we keep saying and that so they have something to go on but also just artistically, they're they're beautiful, they're yeah. colorful, they're bright. They don't um, they don't feel dated neither no, at all. Like they, they don't. feel like they could stand, like you know, th- they could be released today and they'd, they'd match up. And I think it's just so clean. Yeah, I do want to say this because I, I made a note of this, and it's interesting because you know, obviously, Radioactive Man he falls into the origin of the show, uh, or you hear about the character in the show from episode two. So uh, like right there in the beginning, Bart talks about Radioactive Man. He might even mention him in the Tracy Ullman shorts. I didn't even think about that, but. Before they, before Bongo even existed, there was an NES game uh, called Radioactive Man Meets, or Bartman Meets Radioactive Man, uh, which also had art by Bill Morrison. This was 92, and some of the characters that they end up expanding on in these issues are sort of there in the cover of, the, of that video game. You have Dr. Crab, you have someone that looks very similar to Magmo uh, on that cover. And this game was terrible. It was essentially like a reskinned like Mega Man wannabe. Uh, it's 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 horrible, but it's one of the best covers of any of the NES games. And it's also like expensive and rare because I'm sure most people broke their copies in frustration. Uh, <laughs> so you know it is worth tracking down, and it is sort of a relic of the time. It does not feel like a Simpsons game, but I do think it's cool how Radioactive Man uh, was this growing presence in even the merchandising world of the Simpsons. Uh, and he still is to this day. Um, so I, I do think that's a cool little detail to throw in. I'm going to go ahead and add in that, that McFarlane um, toys uh, set that they did a Radioactive Man and, and Millhouse as Fallout Boy. Oh, yeah. Still eludes me because that shit is expensive as hell, it, but it looks so damn good. It 100% is. And Playmates also made one uh, a little bit easier to find, but also not cheap. So, yeah, you're, you're going to be forking out some cash for the Radioactive Man gear. Shoot. Yo, you're trying to do a kill botter? Don't say that. Don't say that loud. <laughs> Warren, I, I know on, on, on your podcast, you know, when you do your Q&A episodes, you tend to sometimes take in like, you know, fan theories or address fan theories and, and questions from, from your listeners. So th- this next one is for you. I don't know if you had a chance to look at that article uh, I, I added from Comic Book Resources, but it was an article talking about a fan theory that Bart's admiration and, and love of Radioactive Man is, is somewhat tied to his father in the sense that, you know, there's the similarity that both Radioactive Man and his father both deal with radio you know his father works at a nuclear power plant so there's that tie hmm. but um and this is something i i noted uh, prior to seeing this that radioactive man kind of looks like homer you know design wise you know definitely. especially in the face granted he's not you know he's definitely more in shape but you know w- with those similarities i was curious to hear your thoughts on this fan theory so i i actually did not have a chance to check that out but i have heard similar things so maybe i've come across that theory before what what i will say uh as you know, as someone who's constantly sort of putting the Simpsons under a magnifying glass is that I think what we learn about Bart is that he sort of admires everyone other than his father 
for qualities that his father has in some way. Like you look at how much Bart looks up to Krusty the Clown. Uh, Bart, you know, Homer looks just like Krusty hmm. the Clown, as we see in Homie the Clown. Uh, you throw the, a wig on Homer and a little face paint, he looks just like him. To the point that that was originally uh, something they had considered on the show to make Homer actually be Krusty. So that the joke is, oh, Bart hates his dad and looks up to Krusty, which means he actually looks up to his dad. Uh, and I think you can sort of take some of that same baggage over to Radioactive Man. It's like Radioactive Man, even in his dialogue in the books, is dumb. He is sort of the way Homer would be if he were a superhero. So I do think there is something to that. Uh, Bart doesn't realize that a lot of the qualities he admires in people like Krusty and even superheroes are actually not that far off from his dumbass dad. Uh, and I think that that is really sort of interesting to unpack about Bart as a character. I said I was going to let you psychoanalyze The Simpsons one time. That's it, baby. That's it. <laughs> hold on, hold on. I I got a question here. I've been I've been sitting on this for a while. Hit me. Uh, so as far as uh, Bill Morrison's concerned, one thing that's kind of common as far as uh, comic books are concerned is a house style. Hmm. And that's something I think we should bring up in that you said that the Bongo comics and Radioactive Man have had sort of like rotating a rotating door as far as different artists are concerned, right? And they all have yeah. different styles. Do each of these styles differ um, based on their stories or do they maintain that same sort of Matt Groening uh, house style? No. So, so that's, that's what's so cool. And I will, I, I'm not just using this as an opportunity to plug my podcast, but I would recommend going and listening to, to both Bill Morrison episodes because we do dig into that just a little bit. They said that when they first started bringing out, bringing in outside artists, they were concerned about changing up things. And a lot of these artists really wanted like, you know, let me get the model sheets. Let me get all these things so I can make it look more like the style. And when Bill and Matt would talk about this stuff, Matt was like, honestly, I say we let them sort of go nuts. Hmm. Uh, so you will see like pretty early into the comics, but especially in like the Treehouse of Horror ones and then ongoing where there are certain issues that could not be further from Matt's style. Like they get Perfect. lanky, they get rough, they get weird to the point that some issues are drawn like hyper realistic where they're almost done in like a traditional comic style with only the Simpsons characters looking a little flat. And so they, the comics get really wacky. If you guys go back and look at my Instagram, uh, Bart of Darkness, I posted a comic in October, one of the Treehouse of Horrors, and there's a whole story about these serial mascots coming to life and attacking the family and the art style. You would never know that was actually official Simpsons artwork. It mm. looks bananas. Uh, cool. And so I think that's the coolest thing about the comics. So if you've never, it's like, let's say you remember those early issues from when you're, from when you were a kid and you want to like, see what I'm talking about, just start buying random issues. They're not really tied together. Uh, they do stick to the, continuity of the show as far as that's possible anyway and there's just some really 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 cool stories especially the treehouse and especially radioactive man so dig into that they really get to play with that is there any artists that uh that you really like their version of the simpsons like style man I'm that was gonna be to my remember. next question i was gonna say who who now let's put let's put warren on the spot here bill yeah. morrison or mac graining oh bill morrison Mm. And I'm okay. going to say that because, there goes a shot for ever getting that. Listen, <laughs> no, he, here's the thing. Matt Groening is a genius and without his art style, there would be so many of the things that I love would not exist. I mean, he truly, you know, the show's goal, even down to the animation early on was to mimic Matt's style as close as possible. And Matt can still draw the Simpsons with the best of them. But the thing is, if you gave Matt and Bill a pen and said, draw Homer doing this. Bill would win that head to head every single time because Bill is like a classically trained artist. Bill, he, he cut his teeth drawing movie posters for Disney, hmm. recreating classic images for Disney. So he is a very intricate and detailed artist. Who's also done stuff for DC and Marvel. He's worked for both houses. Uh, he's done posters for Mondo of Spider-Man that I would argue look as good as Spider-Man has ever looked. I think Bill is one of the best artists to ever do it. Uh, cool. And so as much as I love Matt Groening, uh, as much as he is like the reason for the thing that I love the most uh, outside of 
reality <laughs> exists in this uh, on this earth, I think Bill would win in a head to head. So I got to say, as far as which artist has the coolest looking Simpsons take, that is too hard to narrow down. There is a Treehouse episode. Uh, there's a Treehouse comic uh, where I think it's like ten different artists worked on it, and so er- like every few pages changes. Hmm. Sure. And uh, I will get the number for that to put somewhere on the internet, but you, you will find some really crazy stuff that you can't believe is licensed uh, when you look at those comics. Cool. You don't have the number right now? Yeah, geez. God I you're supposed to be the damn guy. It, Lord, you to... fucking shit the I'm bed have to take again. That back. God damn it. See, never mind. We, we got an amateur. I know. Jesus I know. Christ. Off the streets, apparently. How dare he know everything? <laughs> Do you know how many <laughs> Simpsons how comics know... there are? Yeah. How dare he know 99.999999% of <laughs> There, There are so many Simpsons comics, and it is, I mean, come on, there's yeah. like hundreds. I couldn't possibly remember the number off the top of my no, head. Honestly, and if somebody man, thinks that I'm, that makes me a worse fan, I'll never come on this podcast again. Honestly, man, I'm, uh, I'm very happy you had an answer regarding that house style question, because it was really burning in my mind. Because that's, as far as comic books are concerned, that is one of the biggest things an artist will run into, is that, mm-hmm. okay... I'm working for an established publishing company with established characters and IPs. How much room do I have to play around? And it's almost kind of a comment on what those publishing companies and what those people who are running those books, editors, value. Do they value uh, art or are they going to value the almighty dollar? Or are they going to try and find a way to balance both? For me, I I respect the individuals who value art. I understand it's a hustle. So it's kind of cool that Bill Morrison was like, look, Matt, uh, what do you want to do? You know, mm-hmm. we got this thing. We got these badass artists. I feel like Bill is probably leaning more towards, you know, letting them run around and do their thing. Um, I also feel like Matt would have as well. So it was kind of like a win-win. Yeah. So I'm, 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 I didn't know if you would have that answer, to be, to be honest, and I'm glad mm-hmm. you did. Definitely makes me respect uh, Bongo Comics a lot more. That wasn't just like a quick cash grab you know, for another line of merch. It was like, no, you know, we all love comics here and we're going to do it right. Yeah. And I do want to add to that real quick that to the point where at the end of issue 88, uh, which came out weeks after Jack Kirby had died. So it was very close to where he had died. Uh, and Steve Vance wrote like a tribute to Jack in the back and talked, you know, called him the King and talked about how, you know, we wouldn't be able to do what we do without, you know, mimicking the art of artists like Steve Ditko and Jack Kirby uh, so they, 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 they really, you know, paid respect and, and, and had a, you know, felt the need to say a piece about Jack and his passing, you know, in the second issue of radioactive man. So I, I think that is cool that they, you know, they love comics that much. They felt compelled to do that. Well said. All right. T- to close out the segment, I want to ask you guys, uh, what are some other comics, uh, uh, or, you know, just media in general, maybe that people should check out. If they enjoy this episode, if they're curious about Radioactive Man or, or whatnot. I'm, I'm going to say, you know, uh, if you like the Radioactive Man comics, but you want something that's a little more Simpsons centric, I highly recommend uh, the six issue run of Bartman, <laughs> uh, because specifically in Bartman number three, uh, he is able to bring Radioactive Man to life by using this uh, some some gun machine tech thing that Kang and Kodos create. Uh, that is able to replicate media into real life. And so in an attempt to save the town of Springfield, he videotapes his Radioactive Man comic and brings him out of the comic to fight alongside him to save Springfield. And uh, I I think, you know, these are clearly non-canon, which is why they're so fun. They're essentially like Treehouse episodes in that way that they get to do all kinds of wacky stuff. So I would highly recommend those uh, all six of those Bartman comics, but especially number three, uh, which specifically has Radioactive Man on the cover and sort of like a team up uh, sort of issue. So I think you'll get a lot out of that when it comes to it. And if you're interested in just The Simpsons, I think you start right there at issue one. They really knew what they were doing from the top. And if you enjoy that, just keep them coming. Well said. So you want to add to that? For, for hilarity's sake, you can look up Jack Kirby's uh, Book of Monsters. Because mm. all that stuff, the Magmo stuff, it's all calling back to, Jesus, the names that they came up with. Fing, fang, foom, goo, gam, uh, goom. <laughs> you know, like all those weird ass fucking mm-hmm. consonant and three three vowels of the same thing. You know, like it's like, okay. So you, you, it's it's a lot of fun. All that stuff. 
My dad said he opened up one of those books, and that's how he came about my name. He was like, ooh, Blotter. <laughs> Blotter, invader from Mars. Yeah. I'll go ahead and, and, and add to that and close this out by recommending, if you can get a cop a hold of the 7-Eleven exclusive um, uh, comic of Radioactive Man, that is well worth seeking out. It was released in conjunction, in conjunction with the Simpsons movie in 2007, around that time that they were making like doing the makeovers of the 7-Elevens to look like the Quickie Marts. Bill Morrison is definitely involved in that. He, he writes the main story called The True Origin of Radioactive Man, which is literally just Radioactive Man retelling the same thing, but like very like you know, outlandish and, and uh, he adds some like creative liberties, but <laughs> the art in this, and there's like, like I said, it's about three mini uh, stories in the 7-Eleven comic book, but the art is so amazing. Uh, that, that first story I mentioned has art by um, Tone Rodriguez, which I'm, I'm not familiar with, but I'm about to get familiar with him. Uh, you've also got art by Michael DeCarlo and then art by Hilary Barza. Those last two names I know were really involved with the second series of Radioactive Man in the 2000s. Um, so those are probably worth checking out, but just that first story alone with that art by Tony Rodriguez. I mean, it is so good. It's I was stylized. Gonna say, it's I was going to say, if, if you're a fan of Bongo, uh, Tone Rodriguez, uh, he's, you're going to see his name a lot. Tone across see, you, you the would board, like that, dude. across the board, like even outside of Simpsons, you can look up his stuff, uh, a fucking incredible artist. And he, you know, a heavy hitter in, in Bongo, uh, land also. I mean, he did so no, he is. When you talk about people that can draw The Simpsons well, Tone is up there, but he can draw it all. He's insane. Uh, he's really good. And then last thing I'll, I'll mention, which really, you know, for the most part, if I'm being honest, this was kind of a catalyst to getting this episode uh, off the ground, is the Radioactive Man Radioactive Repository Volume 1. It came out in 2012. I checked on Amazon. There's a paperback version that's a little pricier than the hardback, which is kind of interesting. The hardback is about, you can get it for about 30 bucks on Amazon, but it's probably your best bet of collecting all the majority of the issues of Radioactive Man from both 1993 and 2000 uh, run. Um, it Unfortunately, it's, it's got it kind of like mixed up, uh, a lot of the issues, but Warren just confirmed prior to us in recording that there is a few stories in this issue that were only, I guess, made for this hardcover. Yeah, so what I noticed looking through it is that, um, and I could be mistaken, but I, don't, I can't think of where these stories exist because in the comics, like we said in the episode, they go from issue one to issue 88, and then they jump around from there. Uh, in this book, it goes from issue one to issue 22 uh, to issue like 57. Yeah, it's hard to make before sense. Before it even gets to issue 88. So there's definitely stories in this that I guess could have been in other publications. It could have been inside like, say, a wizard or something. Hmm. I'm not sure. But they don't exist as actual comics uh, outside of this uh, volume one. So I don't know if they were created for this book to further the idea that there's a history that isn't actually there. Hmm. Uh, but either way, it's really cool. And, you know, uh, I, 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 after looking at this book in person, I have to add it to my collection as well. That is the biggest honor you could bestow upon <laughs> me that I inspired a, a Simpsons collection in your soon to be giant, uh, you know, a collection. But my favorite part of, of this hardcover is that Paul Dini writes an introduction and in such a, a funny, brilliant way, he writes it as if he's been a fan of radioactive man, since 1960s and he goes I mean, that's a that's a writer right there it's like a two three page introduction and he's going through like and i remember when the radioactive man tv show came out and i was there when the animated and it's like you know it, it is so great and it really kind of he just leans into the whole joke that is radioactive man that he's been around since the 1960s it's, it's brilliant just for that for that alone that's the best argument i so you know, we're talking about how these are kind of silly and they're obviously, they steal from all these other properties. So, you know, that sort of discounts what they are in a way, but the idea- No way, I didn't say that. No, 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 no. <laughs> but I'm saying in a way it does. I mean, like if you're going- It's in homage. Expecting, yeah. Exactly. But if you're going in expecting like a crazy story that's going to actually stick with you, it's not going to do that. Some of the jokes will, but the idea that they are, they have been running this bit for, you know, essentially 25 years- uh, to the point that they even have people like Paul Dini pretending that they have this fandom for this thing that isn't real. I just think that being in on that joke is a fun place to be. For sure. And it makes it worth reading in more ways than just admiring the art. It's a very Big cool time. thing. Well said. All right. I think Big with time. that being said, we've shown our love for Radioactive Man. So I want to get moving to our next segment. So if you end up reading this series or you just want to tell us what you think about Radioactive Man, I invite you to shoot us a short email to read on next week's episode by writing into the shortboxjacks at gmail.com. We're moving on to our first regular recurring segment now, so it's time to make a choice, Shortbox Nation. 
And if you've been listening to this show long enough, you know we only give you two options to choose from. You can either have a mouthful of tea or a fistful of comics. <laughs> fistful of comics is the part of the show dedicated to all you Wednesday warriors who loyally visit your local comic shops every week. Think of this as a show and tell highlighting only the best new comics on the shelves right now in hopes of making it that much easier for you to grab a fistful of comics next time you visit your shop. This segment is sponsored by Gotham City Limit, Jacksonville's premier shop for comics, toys, collectibles, and more. If you live in the area or ever find yourself passing through Jax, yo, stop by the shop on Southside Boulevard and tell them the short box sent you. Warren, since you're our special guest, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and change up the rules uh, for this episode. I know there's a lot more of the Radioactive Man comics you wanted to spotlight for this episode. It sounded like you had a uh, a fun time going down memory lane and, and reading a lot of the different issues. So how about you give a spotlight for one other Radioactive Man or Simpsons comic that is worthy of people's time? Um, so, you know, I was talking a little bit about um, Bartman issue three earlier, and that is another one that I actually read through again today. And, you know, I think, you know, we talk about homage within these Radioactive Man issues, and, and this one has it even more so because not only are you seeing Radioactive Man and Bartman and Millhouse as a superhero under the name the Scarlet Wimpernell, uh, but you also see the entire town as superheroes because they were something happens to the planet that turns everyone into a superhero. Everyone oh my has God. has a superpower. So I mean, to the point that Ned and Skinner and even Smithers are all just these ridiculous parodies of everyone from Thor to, you know, you, you name it, you see a parody of a character in this issue all throughout Springfield. Uh, Edna is vampire Edna. Uh, and she's just going around trying to suck everyone's blood. So uh, if Yo. you want like a really good time and to see some weird character models that you will literally never see again, uh, I think Bartman three is that outside of that, I would say uh, radioactive man, 1000. Ooh, is a really cool a spawn issue cover. with the spawn cover. I think it's one of the best looking covers and just a really cool story. Uh, I don't think you can really go wrong with, with any of these, um, especially with it only being 16 main issues. And then you got a couple stories uh, with crossovers and things like that. So um, I, I think if this sort of thing interests you, like just grab, you know, throw a dart. I think you'll have a good time with any issue. Well said. Have you seen uh have you read earth X Warren? No, I have not. No, it, essentially, it's the exact same story you just said. Uh, it's uh, it's Marvel's answer, essentially. Oh, sorry, Earth X, Universe X, and Paradise X were Marvel's mm. answer to uh, DC's Kingdom Come. Mm. And uh, in that comic, basically, the Terrigen Mists uh, hit Earth. And pretty much like 90% of the pop I'm exaggerating, but like 90% of the population all end up becoming inhumans. And they all have like abilities and it's up to essentially the previous generation of superheroes to more or less guide slash where are they now kind of thing. Interesting. Um, it's making me laugh because I'm like, yo, somebody over there had to have read that. They oh, for had sure. to have read it and like kind of giggled to themselves and was like, all right, let's do and it. That was, Here we and go. that issue was 94. So that was like super early. But also they in, in this story, like the the what they're trying to do is find a way to rewind time so they can sort of reset uh, everyone back to normal. Uh, but yeah, I mean, just the character design of, of Millhouse as a superhero alone, I'm just going to recommend that highly to everyone. Uh, even though I would, I would argue his name, the Scarlet Wimpernell is so bad, but in a great way. I'm going to go ahead and, and just shoehorn here in here uh, for any Jim Steranko diehards and, and fans that love him as much as I do. There is a great three-issue stretch of Simpsons comics from issue 36, 37, and 38, where every cover is an homage to a classic Jim Steranko cover. Yep. Uh, issue uh, number 37 of Simpsons comics uh, uh, pays tribute to X-Men number 50, which is the first appearance of Polaris. Polaris, I'm sorry. Uh, and, and see, I, I know that you can already Man. see the cover in your face. Like, you don't even need to see it. You just see it in your fucking head. Um, that very, like... You know, the issue where she, the cover where she's standing in the front looking like Magneto, like that green and yellow, it's, they, they be such a good, what's up? As long as we're talking about this, and I'm really kind of disappointed you didn't bring it up, but I'm going to do it anyway. It the Spider-Man number 33 tribute 
where Fallout Boy is lifting up the rubble the way Peter Parker does. Oh, yeah, in issue 88. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Classic, classic iconography. And the best part about that joke is that the payoff isn't as epic as the comic because he just shows up, boom, just yeah. busts out from the bottom. It's like, where have you been? He's like, oh, just lifting up some rubble. Like, yeah. totally deflates all of the epic, yeah. you know, uh, connotations of the original source material that they're drawing from. And it's just kind of like, yeah, we're fans. We get it. We're not. Get- the joke is he didn't have to be like, Uncle Ben, I'm doing this for you. Ant-Man, <laughs> I'm doing this for you. My yeah. strength is actually my people and who love me and I'm Spider-Man. Yeah. He was like, no, nah, I just came up from the bottom. Yeah, they're like, yo, cut off the melodrama Which, shit, all right? Let's perfect. just laugh. Let's just laugh about this shit. All right, Warren, thank you for sharing that spotlight. Now to actually talk about the best new comic books out on the shelves, I asked our good friend Ben Kingsbury, the owner of Gotham City Limit Comic Shop, to chime in with his usual list of top three new comics that are either starting or coming out next month. So these are the comics that he feels like, hey, everyone should give me, uh, everyone should put this on their pull and uh, you know, be on the lookout for them. You know, you don't want he doesn't want you to miss out on these. <laughs> so let's go ahead and cue up the music and get to his list. First up on this one is a comic book series. Looks like a new one at that called The Fourth Man. Uh, number one is going to be coming out through AWA Publishing. Uh, ben writes. A new murder mystery from the new hit publisher, AWA? Yep, sign me up. Uh, the comic will be written by Jeff McComsey and uh, artist Lee Luridge. It comes out January 5th. Uh, and if you're a Spider-Man fan, this one, uh, this next one is for you. And that's Mary Jane, Black Cat Beyond Number 1. Uh, ben chimed in for this one and said that Black Cat has been kidnapped and MJ is the only one that can save her. It's Ben's two favorite ladies from the Spider-Man universe and one comic made for an easy placement on this list. Um, I see you, Cesar. You've got your Spider-Man Marvel Legend front and center. <laughs> I think I got that one somewhere. All right, and, and last not, but not least on Ben's list is actually a shameless plug, which I respect. I respect the good old shameless plug, uh, but it's worthy of its inclusion on this list because it is a brand new comic book that is coming out here soon. It's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number 124, specifically the Gotham City Limit exclusive variant with art by Tyler Kirkham. It's going to homage the first TMNT movie poster from the 90s. So the one where they're all like peeking out from underneath the, 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 sewer, the, uh, the sewer top. Yeah. Uh, it releases December 8th. Uh, so the same day that this episode airs, supplies will be limited. So check in in person at the uh, at the shop if you live here in Jacksonville or the area or purchase one online at GothamCityLimit.com. I know he's got all of his uh, store exclusive variants available for sale online. So even if you don't live in the area, man, go to GothamCityLimit.com and buy yourself an exclusive shop variant. And just tell everyone that, you know, you've uh, you've been to the best comic shop in, in the whole U.S., okay? Just make it easy for yourself. <laughs> so give those recommendations a shot next time that you visit a comic shop or next time you're looking for something new to read. We're going to go on a quick music break before we get into our last segments of the show. I've got something special uh, for this episode just for you, Warren, okay? Oh. So stay tuned for that. But uh, in the meantime, I'm still in a DJ Crumbs kind of mood, so I'm going to play some music from him, and we'll be right back to share our entertainment recommendations for all of you Short Box Nation listeners to check out later this week. Don't go nowhere. Enjoy the music. All right, Short Box Nation, once again, the music you just heard was by DJ Crumbs. If you like that, there's a lot more where that came from on his SoundCloud. Check the show notes for a link to that and show him some love, all right? Now, we don't have, well, before I say that, let me triple check right now, because I don't think we had uh, any emails to read. Granted, we are recording the day after Thanksgiving, so everyone's probably still in a food coma, so I won't I won't hold it up against anyone, all right? I, I just I felt am. like... <laughs> Yeah, true, true. No one loves us. I thought I expected better from you guys. You guys should always be emailing us. But true. Jesus Christ, Potter. You just said that you Jesus were holding it again. Christ. I thought you, I was having your back. You, know, you see what Jesus happens? Man? He sets Christ. me up. He sets me up, and I look like the asshole. Yeah, I, I think C's the one gaslighting people out here. Yo. Yo, look, gaslighting's <laughs> not real. You're crazy. <laughs> so I decided in lieu of emails this week, in the sense we have a, um, a, a special guest, my man Warren Evans. That uh, I'm, I'm gonna play a game. I'm gonna take a page out of your book, Warren, 
I know that recently you started introducing a, a game on your podcast. Sims is greater than you should be subscribed now. Uh, the synopsis game, right? So, and, and I understand that the rules are you give five synopsis, uh, and, and it's up to your guests to tell if they're real or not. And it's usually a fun game. You usually try to stump your guests. Uh, so I decided to make a version of that just for you. It's called the last minute game I created to fill the segment because we didn't get any emails this week. <laughs> game. Instead of asking about fake synopsis, I'll be testing your almost, what, what I feel like is, is almost a photogenic and endless well of Simpson knowledge with trivia questions related to the main, the two main significant radioactive man themed episodes from The Simpsons, episode 21, uh, Three Men in a Comic Book, and episode two from season seven, mm. Radioactive Man. Mm, we'll so, see it. I'm going to go ahead and cue up some dramatic uh, 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 tension music, you know, to, to, to get this thing going. And let's see how many of, of these you can get right. Check I his phone, Butter. Make sure he's not looking. Yo, so, for real, so, give me that phone, son. So, so you got, I got it. I got you, it. You got five of these, and they are facts from those two episodes. And I tell you if they're well, not. It's not five. It's more like six or seven because I okay, can't count. Okay, that's cool. But I, so I tell you if they're <laughs> real or fake, right? No, no. You're just gonna. They're basically just trivia questions. Okay. So you're just gonna give me the answer, right? Uh, I do encourage all of our listeners at home who declare themselves Simpson aficionados to play along. Play along and at home. You, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And if if you and if you truthfully got. A better score than what Warren gets at the end of this. You get to own his house. <laughs> that's it, guys. You get that's so play yeah. along. He play along. Under, you, he just put in a new as a consolation. I mean, yeah, as a, no, as a it's consolation true. prize, you get everything that Warren owns. Everything: his clothes, his beard. You get his beard, guys. It's going to be ridiculous if I don't get these. I yeah. love I love both of these episodes, but I will say, and this is just going to be like. I'm going to preface Making with this excuses in case, already, somebody, see. Making in case excuses. somebody tries to dunk on me. Y'all have no idea how many Simpsons episodes I've watched, so if I slip on this, I don't want to hear it. But I'm not going to slip. Let's go, baby. Let me make a uh, let me make an audio note. Uh, insert tiny violin uh, during that part. Right? <laughs> Listeners, if, if you end up scoring a better score, you know, we're going to use the Boy Scout. You get Scout. his car. Yeah, you get his car. You get something, right? You, no, for real, you will get something. I've got uh, one of these Gotham City Limit exclusive variants for uh, the, oh, the, the Walking Dead issue that he did. Damn, I'm about to pull wow. the Michael Jordan. I'm about to pull the Michael Jordan. <laughs> fuck them kids. I don't want anybody to get anything, so I got to get these right. All right, but like I said, if you truthfully get it right, right in, and we'll get you set up. But enough talking. Let's go ahead and get on with the game. I've got three, six. It looks like about yeah, six questions for you. All right, we'll start out with something easy. Radioactive Man makes a full body appearance in Three Men in a Comic Book in the episode Three Men in a Comic Book, but that's not technically his first appearance in the show. What is Radioactive Man's first credited appearance? Bart the Genius. What episode and season was that? That right? is season one, episode two. Mm, well said. All right, ding ding. January twenty fourth, nineteen ninety. All right, now you're just being a show off. Or January fourteenth, one or the other. I can't remember. All right, next next question. Who is the fictional actor? That plays the role of Radioactive Man in the 1950s era black and white serial that is mentioned in the Radioactive Man episode. Dirk Diggler. Ding, oh, ding. Oh, shit. Seriously? All right. You know, warmed up. Four star. Warm. Right, and and don't, don't be going back and inserting any sort of long pause. I'm answering these bad boys <laughs> on the money, baby. Uh, Potter, make sure you yeah. go back and insert the long pause. <laughs> I listen back to this episode, and Potter's going to make it. He's going to do a doom, 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 doom. Yeah. Oh, doom, time's doom, up, doom. Warren. I, I might just I might just like uh, uh I might just throw in like me uh, acting like Warren like geez Botter these are really hard <laughs> let me think on that <laughs> Mr. Black all right uh, next question how much does Radioactive Man number one cost Bart and Millhouse and Martin in uh, the episode Three Men in a Comic Book I believe it is a hundred dollars survey says ding 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 that is correct all right well wow. said. you got you got the halfway mark baby you got three more to go Ooh, all right let's go. Question number four. Upon What's that pur- tense music you were promising? Well, I don't got to load. I'm going to have to do it on post. Ah. <laughs> I only got it up right now. Um, that's Guys, this the is the kind of crack that, that, organization you gotta, you gotta we, we got going out. on here. <laughs> leave that. It's a solid, <laughs> solid team. All right, all right. For real, next question. Upon purchasing Radioactive Man number one, Martin suggests that they keep the comic at each other's house on specific days. What days does he suggest that Bart, Milhouse, and himself split those up? Oh, man, that's really Ooh. hard. Oh, Yo, g- man. Give me your beard, son. Yeah. <laughs> so, I what I will say, and you can call this a cop out if you want. They do not. They say every day other than Sunday, mm. and Bart says, "What about?" Or Millhouse says, "What about Sundays?" And Bart says, "Yeah, what about Sundays?" And then 
Martin says, we will decide Sundays based on a rock, paper, scissor competition. So while I do not exactly remember which days he suggests to Bart and Millhouse, they say every day but Sunday, and it will be decided by rock, paper, scissors. I hope I get at least partial credit. So anybody that heard and got that, prepare. You can uh, let the air out of Warren's tires right now. Uh, Butter's address (laughs) is... I will give you partial credit because you pretty much got the gist of it. So Martin suggests that Bart gets the comic book on Mondays and Thursdays. Uh, Millhouse will get it on Tuesdays and Fridays. And then Martin himself will get it on Wednesdays and Saturdays. At that point, Millhouse asks about Sundays, which, and this is where uh, you, you kind of jump this part, but Martin then suggests, well, then we'll just use a random number generator. You're correct. And then they split the numbers ah. up. And then Millhouse says, well, what about zero? And then Bart's like, yeah, what about yeah, zero? Yeah, what about zero? And then they decide rock, paper, scissors. That is true. So I'll, partial credit, partial yeah, credit. which is still good, which is still good. Yeah, that's a hard question. You got two more. You got two more to, to Michael Jordan. This, but I'm not right? going to make excuses. Go ahead. What was stopping Bart from getting the role of Foul Out Boy when he auditioned for the Radioactive Man movie? They said that he was too short. Can you recall exactly the, the measurement? If you can recall the measurement of, of how short he was, I'll give you full credit for that other one. Oh, okay. There really is a long pause here. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that's the sound of Warren soiling his jockeys. Oh, man. All over the short box studio floor. So, so you're asking how tall he actually was or how tall he needed to be? What was the discrepancy in his height? Two seconds. The director says, uh, we found our next fallout boy is what I would be saying if you were just a blank inch taller. Oh, I, w- I want to say two inches. I can't remember. It was, a, a, he said, if you were just an inch taller, <clears throat> so a single inch. That seemed too easy. I thought it had to be more than an inch. <laughs> Man, if I had a nickel for every time somebody told me that. <laughs> But hey, I want to I want to point out oh, that's also very true. I want to point out that I got the question wrong. I just didn't get the extra credit question. Fair enough, that's true. Or I got the question right. Point. I just didn't get that's the extra point. credit. Warren was not going to let that slide. That's a very good point. <laughs> All right, well, well, last question for you know to, to round this out, man. Um, at the start of that same episode, Radioactive Man, Bart and Milhouse are in the comic shop, and Milhouse champions a blatant ripoff of Radioactive Man. What was the name of that comic character? And extra points if you could tell me his corny ass catchphrase. Um, so it is his his corny catchphrase is up and let's go. Ding ding ding. So I do know that. And I wanna say it's just radioactive dude. Great save. Because, Absolutely right. because when Milhouse says explain how it's a lame ripoff. He says he has a much worse catchphrase that is up and let's go. And Bart says it with such disdain <laughs> that it's very funny in Millhouse sort of. But Millhouse is being your classic like comic book, you know, comic book reading kid. He's like, explain. He's like being very like, you know, I'm having a debate in the comic shop. For some reason, Radioactive Dude seemed too easy also. So I'm glad that was right. Hold on. Maybe I can give Warren a redemption question. Oh well, I mean, I got them all right except for the extra credit. Hold on, hold on. I mean, this, ah, is, uh, this is good. This is good. Come on, see. This Hit is uh, this is one I, I'm wondering now more just out of curiosity because it always makes me laugh. What did Alan Moore do to Radioactive Man that changed the comic book in Bart's eyes? To not to his detriment because Bart still liked what he did. That's a good one. See, he made him not attractive. Okay. What else? I, I believe he made him a salesman of some sort and made him not attractive. Very and good. Bart, and, Bart, and Bart admitted that he didn't even remember. Bart admitted that he didn't even read them anyway. He just liked the pictures of the fighter. <laughs> Bingo. That's it. Little Lulu, I love you, Lou, just the same. Warren, I, I think I think this you deserve this, man. You deserve this round of applause. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You guys are too kind. Thank you. No, please, have, have a seat. Thank you. You know they could see us, Warren. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> hey, everybody. Speaking of which, by the way, uh, uh, once again, this video ver- the video version of this podcast can be found on our YouTube, but it's only for our loyal short box patrons. So if you're a Patreon subscriber, you can uh, take a look at uh, look at our mugs, man. Just check us out in HD. Yeah, get your bread That's up, not going to sell please. it. Just, just, just say this lie to them. Tell them that, you know... Uh, we got an interview with actually we found a way to interview Jack Kirby um, and Steve Ditko 
and they're with us in studio now. But you'll never know unless you subscribe to our Patreon. So, well, you got to uh, remember, I'm on this. I'm on this episode, so it actually might. You might get some Patreon yeah. uh, subscribers after this. We got we got some sex appeal today. <laughs> yes. Oh my god. <laughs> All right, but look, if you never want to hear me do another uh, random ass game show, then goddamn it, send an email. This is what I've got to do. When you guys don't send in emails, right? Yeah, you guys I'm going to say people might not send emails because that game is fun. I think people might like the game. Mm, that's a good point. The problem is if we maybe play you should with send in else, emails that include games. If we play, yeah, if we say if we play with anybody else, it's not going to be fun. <laughs> Here's your phone back, by the way. Oh, thank he you. wasn't cheating. Oh yeah, my was god, not that's funny. <laughs> All right, listeners, but but for real, um, if you want to send in uh, a short email, or you know, if you want to play. Uh, a game of, of stump the co-host and, and you know send us some trivia questions you can write in a short email of your thoughts and or recommendations or whatever else it may be but uh that email address once again is the shortboxjacks at gmail.com like i said if you truthfully got all of those answers right and you beat warren's score which let's be real i mean he only missed what half of one yeah i only missed half of a question but you know i'm gonna go ahead and say uh, all Michael Jordan glory aside, and all fuck them kids energy aside, uh, you you should probably just lie so Botter has to get, has to give you something. Right. So I won't even be offended. So yeah, I won't be mad. Uh, just send a compelling argument as to why he should give it to you anyway, <laughs> and maybe he will. Actually, I I love that. Even if you didn't get it right, if you're right in a compelling enough argument, and when I say compelling, it just means make us fucking laugh. Then I'll send you this uh, Gotham City exclusive variant for this uh, Walking Dead comic here. All right. So once again, that email was theshortbikejacks at gmail dot com. With that out the way, it's now time to champion some great entertainment from across the larger pop culture universe. Kids, grab your coins because only the best of the best get talked about in this last segment. Champion season. Champion season is the part of the show where we highlight other worthwhile entertainment and recommendations that we feel deserves your attention. These could be much more than comics, but include your mo- our movie picks, TV series, books, or video games, and anything else we're hyped on this week. This segment is brought to you by Black Hive Tattoo, Jacksonville's premier appointment-only custom tattoo studio. If you're searching for a group of talented artists who will work with you to bring your comic culture ideas to life, then look no further. Go to blackhivetattoo.com. And sign up for their newsletter to find out when they're taking new project requests. You know, Warren, I, I got a question for you. Sure. Have you ever gotten any work done at Black Hive Tattoo? Surprisingly, no, but my wife has. My wife has, and uh, I will vouch that Nick is great at what he does. Damn right. And we'll be hearing from Nick. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> we love you, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be hearing from Nick at the uh, end of this segment. But I, I figured I asked. You look like a, a man that has got great taste in tattoos, obviously. Yeah, I secretly just hate getting tattooed, so I just do it very as, as, as less often as possible. Got it. Well, how about this? Um, you know what? I, I've I've started with you all episode, Warren. I'm a, I'm gonna look to our man Cesar to kick us off for. I guess that's season. okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, kind sir. Please, Cesar, the Lord has blessed you. Tell us about your champions today. He's only the Lord of the Simpsons. I'm the Lord of fucking everything. Um, so my champions are gonna be lame after I just made that fucking Lord of everything. Uh, I have been on a Mike Flanagan kick, big time. Uh, I think he's doing some of the best stuff as far as horror is concerned. Um, it's it's flawless. Midnight Mass was great. Um, I guess I'm going to champion The Haunting of Hill House and The Haunting of Bly Manor. I think those are both solid shows. Um, yeah, it got me to the point where I just fell down like everything this guy has done. The prequel to the Ouija movie, which is shit, but the prequel is amazing because he did it. And you don't have to watch that first Ouija movie you can just watch this this prequel um and Oculus is a good horror movie as well I mean he was kind of cutting his teeth but fantastic Mike Flanagan is I, I, I'll, I'll champion that man and he needs to put out more things um and as far as comics are concerned uh much to Ed's joke previously I'm not gonna I'm not going to champion a goon comic but I will champion the art and other mistakes of Eric Powell um, I just got his art book and it's fantastic. It is a hardback, uh, filled. It's written very well because you get to, to see and, and read about his entire meteoric rise. Um, and there's a lot of really good artwork in it from at all points of his life. I mean, this guy had talent out the gate. Like he was that kid you knew in high school 
that like had like long hair and was like like a badass artist and you're like you know like damn like dude what wow these you did this wow this stuff's really good you know and it, he was always like copying the comics from like you know jim like not jim lee but like from like the 80s you know like basically like all right i'm gonna copy this panel here the sketch pad and whatnot and it's a it's a it's a great book because you could be like damn man like he's he's pretty normal like it you know we usually in in the comic uh industry it's easy to see you know your heroes as larger than life especially if they reached a certain level success wise just from being able to sling a pencil right um, Eric Powell is no stranger to this, but it's it's good that this book, he has such a humble attitude. I mean, the, for God's sake, the title is The Art and Other Mistakes of Eric Powell, you know? So, uh, yeah, definitely going to uh, champion that and Mike Flanagan. Great champion, see? Uh, Warren, what about you, man? What do you yeah, got for us this week? So, uh, this actually came out a while ago, but I haven't been on Shortbox in a minute, so I do want to champion it. Uh, there's a graphic novel slash comic slash whatever you want to call it put out by uh, Jordan Morris and Sarah Morgan called bubble. And, uh, that's essentially like a take on, you know, the gig economy, but in a society that is dealing with monsters and various other things. So it's very funny, very lighthearted, but also, uh, very compelling and sort of, a a glimpse into the horrible future. I'm sure we're all going to have to deal with when we're older. Uh, so a really good and funny book that, uh, illustrated by Tony cliff. It looks fantastic. I highly recommend everyone check that out. Uh, you might know Jordan from, he's a, he's a comedy writer. He's a podcaster, very funny guy. And it was actually a podcast before it was adapted into a graphic novel. So uh, a lot of really good stuff there. Maybe check out the podcast if that interests you. Uh, in addition to that, I do want to champion. I got a lot of champions just because it's been a while. And I want to champion a couple of shows. Uh, so Why the Last Man, which is also based on a comic, as I'm sure a lot of you know, uh, and I had never read the comic, but I had heard such good things about it. And I was very interested in the story. And I thought the show was fantastic. I, I hung on every episode. I couldn't wait week to week. And before the season was even over, it was announced that it was not being renewed by the, uh, by the channel, uh, by the network, because uh, COVID put them in such a delayed state that they had to have contracts figured out by this date, and some people were already doing other stuff. And a lot of things complicated this show getting renewed. Uh, the creators have said they want to shop it and try to get it put on another network. So go watch that show. It ends on a nice place. So, I mean, you'll still feel like you've got a whole story. Um, and if you like it, you should get online and just complain and bitch and tell people to watch it because I hope it gets made somewhere else. I need to see more of that story. The characters are great. Uh, so why the last man high recommendation. Uh, I'm also rewatching Dave season two right now. I think Dave is one of the best, uh, shows on television right now. Uh, a lot of people are sleeping on it, including Botter, yes, possibly even Cesar. I love that uh, you came on here to publicly shame me. I, I, I am. I that's that's got... what I'm trying to do. Dave is great. I've told Botter to watch it multiple times. I believe Ashley has championed that show as she well. Has. Uh, it is really, really great. Uh, it's incredible for a show to be that funny that weird and somehow still touch on such emotional notes. I think that's the theme of all these champions uh, in a similar way to bubble where it is, it's comedy in a lot of ways, but it finds a way to make you care emotionally. And that's a special gray area that a lot of things cannot hit. So Dave, if you haven't watched it, go watch it. Season three will be coming eventually. And the most recent thing that I watched is a show called dope sick on Hulu <laughs> which is about the oh, uh, shit. the Oxycontin <laughs> epidemic. Uh, and I really, really liked that show. If you are a Michael Keaton or a Rosario Dawson fan, uh, the acting in that show is just fucking top notch. And it's a mini series. It's one season, eight episodes. Every episode is about an hour long. Uh, I really, really liked it. So I would like to champion all of that. I laugh My because wife loves uh, that show. Yeah. Cesar was just telling me, uh, well, no, his wife was literally selling me on that show and it was sounded fascinating. If you want she's a, to, she's a nurse. So she's like, oh, yeah. she watches it with like so much attention. And like, I feel like she's going to go back to her job and like, she works as uh someone who helps people from like uh very intense heart surgeries. Like she's the, she's the nurse that kind of takes care of individuals after that. And 
I feel like someone's going to be like, help me, please. I need my medicine. She's like, nah, son. You know how bad that shit is for you? You're fucking pumping poison in your brain. You fucking they'll be like, uh, Sarah, calm down. It's just Tylenol. Yeah. No, nah, I've been watching Dope Sick. Nah, son. If you, if you have ever been curious about how a drug like Oxycontin that was so dangerous became so normalized, uh, the show is very eye-opening and very good. And like I said, if you can name a show where you go wrong with Michael Keaton or Rosario Dawson or any, I mean, it's, it's a great cast, uh, just great acting floor to ceiling. Uh, so dope sick. I mean, it's, it's, it's frustrating and it's, uh, depressing, but it tells a very necessary story. It's something people should know about, uh, because you never know when we're going to have to deal with something like that again. So, uh, definitely dope sick. Check it out. Well said. Very thoughtful champions. Good champions, man. Thank you. Well said. All right, uh, I've got one to share today, and it is uh, it's a throwback, but a, a masterpiece. Consider a masterpiece to many, and that is uh, Lone Wolf and Cub. I started reading uh, Lone Wolf and Cub a uh, few weeks ago. I'm on the second volume, and I'm pretty much addicted. Um, if I'm not reading anything related to the show, I'm usually trying to catch up on Lone Wolf and Cub. For those unaware, it is a Japanese manga series created by a writer, and I'm probably going to butcher these, so I apologize in advance, but it's uh, it by a writer, uh, Kazuo Kowaik. And then artist Goseki Ko, uh, Kojima. Uh, it was first published in 1970. Tells the story of Ogami Ito, the Shogun's executioner who was cast out in disgrace due to false accusations from another hating ass clan, hoping to gain favor from the Shogun. Uh, Ogami Ito is forced to take the path of the assassin, but he brings along his three year old son, uh, Diogoro, and, they, and together they're seeking revenge on that hating ass clan. Potter, yeah, just, how how many times have you listened to Liquid Swords since reading? <laughs> You're not yet, but I'm I'm this since close. Reading. That, like that'll you, be you, nice. or or just to nice. hear that those those clips from Shogun Assassin, where it's like, when I was young, <laughs> my father was the greatest samurai in the land. He was the emperor's chief decapitator. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty close. I think you know. Now that you mention it, I should have that playing in the back while I'm while I'm reading this. Um. But the the story spans 28 volumes of manga, so that's about like 8,700 pages in total. Uh, it's been adapted into, I mean, as Cesar was kind of hinting at, you know, six films. It's even been a couple of plays. It's been a TV series. Um, we've definitely talked about its influence on recent properties like The Mandalorian uh, on the show. But its inf influence and important goes well beyond just that. Um, I've been reading the digital Omnibus Collected Editions that Dark Horse put out in, in 2013. Most of them are available and free if you got a Comixology Unlimited subscription, which, in my opinion, makes it worth it just alone. So if you enjoyed The Mandalorian or, or comics like Frank Miller's Ronin or movies like Road to Perdition or, or Kill Bill, I think it is imperative that you check out this samurai epic and see where all of those kind of pulled from. Uh, yep. the, the writer, um, interestingly enough, was, was inspired uh, partly by what he felt was like a sense of um, deteriorating family values in Japan at the time. So he wanted this story to serve as an example of like the invincible bond between father and son. And, and he nails it, man. The, the art is amazing. It, it, I think Ed, you know, to coin Ed's phrase, you know, it's, it's deceptively, deceptively simple. But it, it's, yeah, you could tell like a master is, is behind that uh, ink brush. So highly Choose recommend it. Choose the ball and yeah. you join your mother in death. <laughs> Choose Yo. the sword and you will join me. When you get to that part in the in the comic, it's it's so crazy, man. Because you've spent so much time just watching this father and son go on these like these journeys and run into these other you know uh, Ronin and, and assassins, and you don't get much story until the very end. And by then, you've kind of built this bond between them two. And then when you realize, like, oh, this is why they're on you know this road uh, that they're on, it it just tugs at your heartstrings. So check that out. And uh, that is my champion. And since this segment is brought to you by our good friends at Black Hive Tattoo, uh, here's Nick Wagner, the head honcho of Black Hive himself, giving us one last recommendation for this week. Hey, guys. Nick Wagner of Black Hive Tattoo with uh, this week's pick. It's probably going to be pretty unpopular, but I am going to champion the live-action Cowboy Bebop on Netflix. Uh, I recently rewatched the anime. And immediately went into this one, not realizing it was like so close on the heels. And I gotta say, it's super respectful of the uh, original storyline. Uh, the updates I like, I think they're smart. The actors clearly love the original because they are leaning into the characters. And the first watch feels a little corny, but the second watch, I really think it's I feel like it's kind of pitch perfect. So I don't know. Give it a chance. All right, have a good one, and uh, happy belated Turkey Day, everybody. Hey, thank you, Nick. 
Uh, yes, uh, like I said earlier, we are recording this on the day after uh, Turkey Day, and this episode comes out a, a week a week out. So or or Tofurkey Day. Ah, uh, that's true. Thank you so much. I, I don't want to you know I don't want to exclude anyone. Cornbread Man, there was no day. fucking vegans in the fucking Mayflower. <laughs> Cornbread dressing day. <laughs> there was yeah, they no were, vegans they were, there. They were called hyper poor people. They were uh, they were like, what are these bloody savages going to give us now? Yes. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna assume that Nick uh, probably heard um uh, our hawkeye episode and got to hear uh ed and ashley both kind of team up the champion the live action uh cowboy bebop show i know um you know speaking of, of other hosts that champion it uh drew has been speaking pretty highly about it as well yeah that has not been what i have heard from literally anyone god damn warren why'd you have to warren yeah. why'd you have to Come say on, something man. god we're damn it we're trying to keep it positive here. i could have said but, that shit looked fucking but, horrible but, but <laughs> also i am not versed enough in cowboy bebop but I have watched side by sides, and I gotta say, as someone looking from a distance, I can't imagine calling it respectful of the. I mean, to me, it seems like bad dinner theater version of Cowboy Bebop. Warren, but, Warren, Warren. But I am not enough of a fan to speak on that, and I have not watched the whole episode, so I'm gonna leave. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm about to say I'm gonna keep that opinion to myself, but clearly just, I'm not because I've already you said. You just it. already put your dick all over that shit. It's fine. Man. It's fine. Warren, we're not gonna talk about. We're not gonna talk about how John Cho is way too old to fucking play Spike. We're not hey. gonna talk about how any of the characters really don't get their parts. Hey right man, why is she show... wearing? Why is she wearing less clothes, man? She's supposed to be like real hot and stuff, ain't she? Look, look. We've already look. addressed that last episode. <laughs> I listened. I know. People are dumb for saying that, I want to say. John that. Mesopotamia Cho is is flawless as an old man playing a young man who moves too slow for his part. That's fine. It's okay. Let them enjoy their shitty cowboy bebop live action. And we'll just sit <laughs> here and, and and enjoy it as well. So uh once again, that was a pick from Nick Wagner, our sponsor of this <laughs> sponsor segment. Sponsor for the show. Black Hive. Thankful. Tattoo. Look, listen, uh, let me say something here. Uh, everyone knows uh, we that keep it I, real here on the short box no, no, even no, to our not, own detriment not only that but <laughs> it's okay to disagree I think the current season of the Simpsons is one of the best in 10 years and there's people that refuse to watch Simpsons beyond season 10 so it's okay to disagree everybody yeah. if you if you like if you don't like the Simpsons after 10 you can suck my whole d- but I just want wow. you to know wow Warren way to make it about you, you to know that it's okay to have different opinions. And I thought The Simpsons was a family show. You are not a good representative. I don't oh. actually mean that, everybody. If you disagree with me, that's okay. I love you. <laughs> All right. Well, look, that is, uh, that is our recommendations for this week. We got one more thing bef- to do before we put a nice bow on this episode. And I know it's not Cesar's favorite part of the show, but I've, I've enjoyed doing this the last few episodes. Let's close out with some parting knowledge and oh, last shit. words. Warren, how about you kick it off for, it, for me? Tell me something you learned today. I, you know, I learned today that um, it's okay to have different opinions and come on someone's <laughs> podcast and tell their listeners to suck your whole. <laughs> um, no, uh, I don't actually mean any of that, anybody. And if I offended you, I'm so sorry. What did I learn today? Um, I learned today that uh, it is really fun to examine a comic book that pays homage to things that you don't actually get all the time. Uh, and I think that it speaks to the subject of today's episode that you can appreciate a comic that sort of exists to spoof other comics. And even having not read or seen some of those comics, it still speaks to you and you still sort of get what it's doing. So I think today, if I've learned anything, it's that we should all be a little more open minded. Isn't that great, everybody? Mm, well said. You can keep that bullshit to yourself. Uh, see, what oh, about shit. you, man? <laughs> what you learn today? I learned that Nick Wagner has got Alzheimer's, and um, he, I need to call him. And it's not fair that I don't visit him in the old home like I used to. Um, it's not fair, and you can start to see the deterioration, ladies and gentlemen. It's it's not a joke. It's it's it is a real disease that affects so many people, and during the holidays, especially, we we all must remember to remember yeah, those. This is true. Who enjoy uh, <coughs> Cowboy Bebop? Anyway, uh, no man. All kidding aside. I will say I learned that I think I'm a radioactive man fan. Like I had no idea I was I was not going to delve into the comic um simply because I've been steeped in so much stuff that has parodied and uh d- drawn homage to a lot of the old school stuff that basically has been sort of 
seminal and foundational if you're a comic book head. Um, but this has something new to offer, and it's got uh, a lot of cool little things that has there's, there's nuggets that have yet to be mined, and I found that refreshing. And I never would have known that if I hadn't picked up these three issues and uh, read them. And it was cool talking with you boys about that stuff. So awesome. And, and I will I will throw in one more thing, uh, just as another way to sell Radioactive Man to you. If if you appreciate the way, like, you know, one of my favorite artists, and I know C and Botter both agree with me, is, is MF Doom. And if you appreciate the way that MF Doom sort of exists in this weird space where everything is sort of a nod to comic book culture more than it is directly to just comics, uh, I think Radioactive Man is a version of that in print, where it is a way of just showing how cool comic culture is as a medium uh, beyond just the stories and the art style. And so if you respect that sort of take and that sort of just feel that speaks to that, uh, Radioactive Man does that in the same way that, say, Zarface or MF Doom may do. So I think you would find a lot that you love about what Radioactive Man is doing. I think you'd find a lot to, uh, to, to appreciate ongoing after checking these issues out. Appealing to my hip hop love. I love it, Warren. Thank you. That was good. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say that I learned that it is not appropriate to come on someone else's podcast and tell their listeners to suck their, your whole entire yeah oh, thank you so much i misquoted that Un um, unacceptable yeah i really should probably vet the people i have on uh the show a little better right things that are appropriate on the yep. show thank you comparing thank you. our sponsor to someone who is delusional with dementia <laughs> absolutely absolutely appropriate but what warren did cross the line cross yeah, the line 100 percent um, and I definitely want to let any uh, future sponsors know because I'm sure that the uh, slot for champion season will be opening up relatively soon. <laughs> <laughs> Bonner's going to be on the street with sunglasses on and a cup with pencils in it, begging for money like a cartoon character in like yo, two seconds. Son, yo, just sponsor my segment, man. I was like, yo, come on. Yo, <laughs> Uh, jokes, <laughs> jokes aside. Um, what is happening? These are the holidays, guys. Oh, What's man. happening right you now? You know, it, it's because we're, we're still, you know, uh, full of uh, turkey and it's got all the weird chemicals doing stuff to our brains. Anyways. Yeah, um, yeah. I will go ahead and truthfully say that all of those, um, those 700 texts that Warren flooded my, my phone with when he really got into his Simpsons uh, comic craze and he was like getting back into it were all pretty spot on. Uh, the Simpsons comics... It's not some uh, cheap gimmick or, you know, just another line of, of merchandise and money making. It's, it's filled with a lot of passion and love into. Uh, and I thought what Cesar said earlier was, was great. If you are an existing comic book fan, um, you will get so much out of this, man. Not only are you getting a great product on its own at the face value, but if you're familiar with like that golden age of comic books and that atomic age of superheroes, it just it, it pays off in so much different ways. And, and, and dividends galore is what I'll say. Um, but I think we're at a good stopping point. So there you have it, Short Box Nation. Thank you for hanging out with us this week. Tell us what you thought about this episode or what you think about Radioactive Man. Or tell us about your favorite Simpsons comic or maybe comic book-themed episode. I'm sure, Warren, there's a, there's a few really good Simpsons uh, comic book-themed episodes you'd Absolutely. probably recommend. Uh, but give me one real quick. Uh, the one where Homer becomes a superhero named Pie Man mm. uh, is a very bizarre uh, episode and really fun. There's also an episode where Homer... Uh, is written by Seth Rogen and he becomes a different sort of superhero for a he becomes a superhero that comic book guy created that then gets famous and uh, I don't know how much I recommend that one because it's very strange but it is a spectacle so if you're a Seth Rogen fan look that one up and check that one out but yeah definitely the Pie Man episode really really great check it out well said check those out hit up our DMs on Instagram and Twitter or send us a short email to read for the next episode. Like I said, if you got that compelling argument why you should win that Gotham City Limit Walking Dead variant, or if you truthfully beat Warren's score, which I you did highly it. doubt. That's right. <laughs> yeah, slide um, into our slippery, wet, sloppy DMs. Slide right into them. Well, that would be slide. Cesar's DMs. Suck our slide. whole DM. <laughs> slide right into those warm All right. salty all right thank you Cesar. DMs. Uh, thank you i'm talking about dms dude. got it DMs, come on DMs. speaking of next episode there might not be one and that's because 
<laughs> that's because that's because Warren came on here no. and said to <laughs> Well, th- that is definitely going to uh, that's going to come back and bite us in some way. But that's because next week is our live show, and if you live in Jacksonville, the surrounding area, your ass better be there. Okay, um, come out December tenth. That's a Friday from seven to eight, and be a part of a live audience for a live recording of the podcast. I think Warren better be there because I mean he's already cost me. Uh, yeah, you know, I don't want to hear money. any excuses, especially there. if you're local. Like, oh, I'm adopted, and it's the first time I'm meeting my biological parents. Oh, I can't come to the show. Yes, Fucking he's going to be it. there on Zoom, so. Yeah, get over it. <laughs> oh, I got fucking um, cancer. <laughs> no, right, I don't want to hear that shit. This is going very dark places. No, I don't want to hear it. You better come to the show. We will sure. We will do everything we can to make it worth your while. If you don't show up, well, then we'll kill you. So just yeah. don't worry about it. Uh, tickets are free if that's if that's worth <laughs> mentioning anything. <laughs> and it's the last episode of Shortbox ever. After yeah, for this. sure. Uh, so yeah, tickets are free, and most importantly, we will be premiering a new project uh, that we've been working on. Yeah, uh, and, and it'll be a damn good time, man. If you've ever been to, any I'm of having our live trouble shows, feeding my family. I can't come to the work. show. <laughs> oh, I lost my job over the holidays, and I got nibble marks on my 38 special. Oh. They yeah, are. just come to the Ladies show, guys. It'll this cure is everything. this is legit. The last episode, yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's a wrap. Thank you for tuning in and being loyal fans all these years. Uh, but now, for real, uh, the live show will be a good time. Check out the show notes for uh, a link to free tickets, um, and I'll try to have audio from that show uh, up next week for all you out of towners. So stay tuned to the feed. But if that's too long for you to wait, become a Patreon subscriber like our newest member, Kara, and get access to more episodes and bonus content like our spinoff podcast series, Pilot's License. If you love classic comic book cartoons and animated shows as much as we do, this series is for you, all right? Go to patreon.com slash the short box to sign up or just click the link in our show notes uh, to make it easy on yourself. In the meantime, stay up to date with what we got going on by following us on social media. And most importantly, take care of yourselves. Have a great day. And please continue to make mine and yours short box. We'll talk to you soon. Peace. Well, the world is safe again. But for how long? 